What it really takes is a family, and we as conservatives have to fight for the family. A party that desires to lead this country must have an agenda that the American people believe helps them. What is it that we can do to keep government from growing so large we can win this battle? I have the honor of introducing Philip Blond, who is the original post-liberal. His 2010 book, Red Tory, How Left and Right Have Broken Britain and Can Fix It, um, was influential on both sides of the Atlantic uh, in encouraging new thinking on the right. And in fact, uh, back in 2010, I participated in a panel organized by Patrick Deneen at Georgetown University that featured myself, Rob Dreher, uh, Ross Dowlett, and a number of others talking about Philip Blond's thought and his book, Red Tory. Philip Blond is the director of the Res Publica Policy Think Tank in the UK. He has advised the last three prime ministers, David Cameron, Theresa May, and Boris Johnson. Perhaps soon he will have an opportunity to advise a fourth prime minister. He comes to politics, policy, and political philosophy from the realm of theology, which he taught at the universities of Exeter and Cumbria. And he is presently professor of Christian philosophy and politics at the University of Public Service in Budapest. Please join me in welcoming Philip Blond. Thank you all um, so much, and, and how wonderful to be here. I always find it rather marvelous to, to come to uh, America, because it, the, le the level of debate on the right here is far greater than that uh, in my own country. And it's um, wonderful to see the contest now within conservatism between nationalism and old-style libertarianism and the level and depth of intellect that's at play. And it's wonderful also to speak at uh, ISI that is continuing uh, a civilizational project when all about us the need for such gets greater and greater. So thank you, uh, Daniel, uh, for your, your kind introduction. The paper I'm going to give is really in three parts, and I suspect as I go through the paper, uh, the level of consternation will increase. I mean, maybe you'll all be persuaded of the virtues of empire and Christian civilization at the end. I, I trust that will be the case. But, but I'm used to my ideas being at first repudiated and then, dare I say it, being accepted. When I first wrote, read Tory in England, it was in 2009. The work was published in 2010. To, I am glad to say, widespread derision and rejection by liberals of, of left and right. The central message of the book, unheard, dare I say it, hitherto for, was that social liberalism and economic liberalism were the same phenomenon and both were to be repudiated. Why? Because liberalism was, and is, the governing ideology of a segregating, divisive, and decadent class that in the name of its ascension has unhomed humanity and unhinged the world from its continuance, and has moreover exposed the West to its enemies who are genuinely both foreign and domestic. When I first wrote, post-liberalism, as we now call it, had no contemporary advocates in any sort of power in the West. Everyone on the left was a social liberal, and everyone on the right was an economic liberal. And so they had happily conspired from the 1960s onwards, allies at the deepest level, unbeknownst to themselves, conspiring together against the common good. Economically, modern liberalism found us as it is on the fiction that autonomy provides for the community has widened inequality by several orders of magnitude, 
and in dubious alliance with failing welfare states, has proven utterly unable to distribute and share economic gains, either productively or equitably. Equally, modern liberalism has presided over the creation of new vast monopolies and oligopolies that would have made the executives at Standard Oil blush. Modern right liberals are manifestly, for they do nothing about it, in favour of monopoly, oligopoly and the plutocracy that inevitably flows. I think it's an enduring stain on all parties of the centre-right. The acceptance of the uh, antitrust paradox and the compliance with the rise of monopoly. And it's, it's inevitable, really, uh, now that when the tech monopolies have, have shifted over to the left, a last protest arises. But again, still no action on antitrust. And modern left liberals are equally happy at creating the welfare states that ensure survival of the indentured class, but equally ensure that none will escape the new feudal bonds. Socially, liberalism atomizes. It makes unviable the family unit and restricts the formation of such to the upper class. Only the rich now marry. And it does so because that is the class that social liberalism exclusively serves. It penalizes the birth and care of children and eschews and demeans all wider forms of social and civic fraternity as it privileges the maintenance of the ascendant class and its autonomy above all else. Which is why, of course, it has crafted and embraced woke culture. For after all, the aim of political identity politics is to mask the reality and cost of class in American life by denying the possibility of shared values and wider goals that can alleviate and remove the penalties of working class life and placement. And council culture has the happy effect that it allows the self-same children of the haute bourgeoisie to remove and replace any impediments to their own advancement. For in the end, the culture that is cancelled is anyone who is not of and with them. So conceived, social liberalism suppresses the lives and hopes of ordinary people, and it is the means by which their agency and purpose can be both thwarted and denied. Politically, liberalism achieves the opposite of what it promises. Because it denies the importance of tradition, social cohesion, and the formation of shared values, it produces a fragmented and warring populace that itself requires the Leviathan to police it. Far from being anti-statist, it introduces the state as a, as a necessity, as an absolutist and partisan policing power that ensures partisan rule by empowered minorities over subjugated majorities. The freedom it secures is the freedom of the abandoned, the freedom not to have a home and pitch your tents on the intersection and grass verges of America's highways. Philosophically, liberalism is founded on the exercise of untrammeled human will, as ontologically it has already vacated the idea that we live in an objective world whose universals exist and can be known. Instead, human fiction supplants truth and indeed becomes subservient to it, such that men are now claimed to be women and women are made untrue. Theologically, of course, liberalism is atheist in belief and nihilistic in practice. In a Feuerbachian inversion, all that is human is recast as the new divinity. And like the pagan gods that preceded them, and that monotheism overthrew, the only rule in such a pantheon is the exercise of violent and arbitrary power. So you can tell I'm not a fan. So you would think with that legacy and with that uh, import and impact, liberalism would not have a future, that it had been fatally compromised and new alternatives and new options 
would be emerging. Indeed, after the financial crash and the onset of mass migration, the offshoring of industry and manufacture, what we call populism was at least partially enthroned. Brexit, Trump, Gilets jaunes in France, the permanent eruptions of the anti-migrant vote in Italy. Populists attained power in America, in Britain and in Italy, and they made inroads and had moments of power and political opportunity virtually everywhere else. In Central Europe, post-liberalism has governed very effectively, in Poland and in part in Hungary as well. But elsewhere it has failed and failed consummately. In the wake of its failure, parties have retreated to their comfort zones and liberal convention rules once again. In Britain, for instance, we have the right retreating uh, to versions of Thatcherism when their electorate lies in the north, when their electorate that gave them the majority are working class. And none of the contenders for the leadership had any offer that could be construed as pro-working class or as securing the life of the British working class. And consequently, British conservatism operates in a dreamland where its majority always lies in the southeast and the key to power is to reassert Thatcherism yet again and yet again, but with a louder voice. So why has post-liberalism failed so far in the West when it has succeeded elsewhere. There is a conventional explanation, which isn't wrong because it's conventional, but by the same token, it isn't right enough. Nonetheless, it has some purchase on reality, and that is the absolute lack of any serious policy offer from post-liberals. In Britain, we have simply ignored the needs of the new electorate and happily recycled the ersatz Thatcherism as if our majority, as I say, lies permanently in re-offering the 1980s. In America with Trump, we saw tariff-led protectionism abroad, but still free market monopoly at home. The experience has veered from incoherence to chaos and back again. The consciousness in, in the Western West, if I can call it that, is too fragmented and the polity too divided between a future yet to arise and a past that has shaped and already defeated too many minds. The second and more telling account is that we have not been romantic enough, that we have eschewed disastrously the language of the universal and ignored the idealism of human beings. In short, the post-liberal right has taken the nationalist path in America, the UK and France, all great current or past empire nations, and has manifestly failed in all other areas, bar those where nationalism retains a deep and lucid hold, for example, Poland and Hungary, i.e. those countries that have paid the price of imperial empires that were themselves also deeply nationalistic. Places where the disasters of the 20th century have destroyed multi-ethnic polities and replaced them with what one can only call ethno-states. If you look back at the beginning of the First World War, the whole of Central Europe was multivalent in terms of religion, ethnicity, and nation. The Poles in Poland constituted only something like a third of the nation. Now, ethnic Poles make up 98% of the population. For what post-liberalism in the West has, has done is we have neither catered to the needs of the working class nor persuaded the middle class of the merits of our endeavors. There are attempts, especially in America, to speak to this, but as you will soon hear, I feel too, rather unfortunately, that this is also a cul-de-sac. So where America, I think, is an advance of, of Britain, uh, uh, is that you at last have developed a language of the policy offer for uh, your working class electoral base. What Jim Banks is doing, what Mario Cuomo, uh, not Mario Cuomo, sorry, uh, that was uh, an interesting slip. Um, what your, your senators have, have uh, constructed with the, the attempt to appropriate the Catholic account of, of the common good 
is something that is potentially transformative. If one, I read uh, again the other day, Marco Rubio's uh, piece in First Things, and I thought not only would this save the working class, but this actually could persuade the middle class to vote for you. What I've always thought and what I've always advised every British prime minister is deliver for the working class and the middle classes will follow. Across the West, as you know, the working class has shifted to the right and the middle classes are now, have now shifted to the left. In a recent poll in America, only 9% of those with a college degree thought that the cost of living crisis mattered for them. The middle classes are unconstrained because they have assets by the economic uh, crisis that has befallen them. Or befallen rather, not them, but their nation. And they are voting on what they perceive to be the needs of the poor. But all that the left offers the poor is the permanent subjugation to the welfare state and as a client class for servicing the middle classes in their nice homes and estates and houses. If the right can actually deliver emancipation for the working class, it's long been my belief that a significant proportion of the middle class will shift and will vote right for a right that genuinely delivers. This, for me, is the political path of the future. But we've, we, have, at least in Britain, have found it almost conceptually impossible to create a policy offer for the working class, since everyone who's in the parliamentary party seems to have Thatcherism sealed into their brains by some dark, arcane process that, thankfully, I escaped. Now, in America, you have created um, something kind of very interesting in the nationalist uh, response to what you take to be liberal globalism. In a recent issue, the American Conservative, a fine publication, published a statement of principles for national conservatism. It attempted to encapsulate and legitimate the new nationalism that conservatives in America and elsewhere are avowing as their sole defense against, and I quote, universalist ideologies seeking to impose a homogenizing locality-destroying imperium over the entire globe. By such a recast, American conservatives think that nationalism is apparently the sucker that will save us all. It will restore patriotism, loyalty, religion, and family. Nationalism will deliver us freedom, security, and prosperity by crafting an alternative to a globalist liberalism that has undermined the general welfare through imperialism and imposition of its norms on differing populations and diverse peoples. At first blush, as a conservative, one is sympathetic to the outcomes that are claimed for such an approach. After all, globalized markets in both people and production have despoiled the life, security, and hope of not just the American working class, but the working class in all developed Western nations. Through mass migration and the offshoring of jobs and factories, wages have been depressed, and the idea of supporting a family through ordinary neighbor, labor now appears delusional. Moreover, an unconstrained individualism that eschews human solidarity has indeed shattered the nuclear family and deprived the marginalized of societal security and beget a class of fatherless children who will repeat this social structure when fully grown. The signatories of this statement of principles then rightly decry racism and moot that their nationalism somehow escapes any reduction to ethnicity and also somehow restores the rule of law and therefore social and political peace as well. But unfortunately, it is not remotely clear that any of this is in any way true. Nationalism as the first premise does not lead to any of these purported outcomes. One need only turn to history for refutation of such. It is a historical truism that the great killing organization of the modern age is nationalism in the form of the nation state. 
Nationalism is not historically civil. Rather, it is almost universally uh, tending to the monocultural and the monoethnic. And in its modern form, it is marked by a reduction of a prior and plural civic political identity to ethnic homogeneity. Hence, it is the nation state that historically has always tended to extinguish diversity and racial heterogeneity, whereas it is empires that, have, that encompass many nations that have sustained ethnic and religious diversity and protected minorities. And, it's, and the racial cleansing, if one can call that, that, or the sorting of populations and the persecution of minorities came when empires broke up and nations formed into their own ethnic cantons. In addition, the economic globalism that the authors rightly protest against is not created by the globe or by aliens, but by nation states that wish to dominate and determine the international trading system. For example, the entire liberal global trading system that came into being after the Second World War was implemented and driven not by many nations, but by one following its own self-interest, the United States. Not only is this thesis as to the merits of nationalism wrong historically, it is also wrong politically, philosophically, and theologically. Politically, nationalism does not provide security. On the contrary, it provokes conflict, both foreign and domestic. Externally, nationalism cannot forge common bonds and shared values with other nations, as that would compromise the inalienable sovereignty of the nation state. Indeed, almost by definition, the nationalist state must always be in conflict with others, as any affinity or shared purpose between states is a dangerous chimera that suggests governance by the supranational and the dissolution of the nation. Similarly, in terms of the domestic, I know of no civil nationalist state, either historically or currently. I only know of would-be nationalist states that struggle to deal with any ethnic or cultural variation in their borders, think Israel and the position of its Arab citizenry. And the nationalist states that do exist are neither civil nor peaceful. Rather, they are violent and imperial, think Russia and China. In short, the manifesto claim that nationalism delivers peace appears somewhat bizarre. Philosophically, the authors of the National Conservative Statement of Principles are understandably and rightly trying to marshal conservative forces against liberalism and the damage it undoubtedly does to human flourishing in general and working class life in particular. I am completely with them on that. It is then doubly perplexing that they choose nationalism as their means. For nationalism is liberal in both origin and practice. All the great nationalist revolutions in Europe after 1848 were liberal revolutions that went on to construct nation states that themselves then fostered and drove the carnage of the 20th century. Each ethnic state destroyed the multiculturalism of the empires or polities they broke up to pursue subsequent war and colonization. The paradoxical truth is the liberal regimes and revolutions of the 19th century destroyed the very differences they claim they wish to protect. And they created the ethno-nationalist states that then produced in the century that followed inestimable conflict and destruction of human life. And nationalist states in practice operate very clearly on explicit and extreme liberal principles. It may surprise uh, readers or listeners of this piece, but liberalism is not a nice ideology about being kind and sharing and welcoming to people and minorities. At base, in all of its foundational works by Hobbes, Locke and Rousseau, it is an extreme eulogy to human freedom and the denial of any other value or standard except that of unconstrained human will. It denies relationships, solidarity, shared purposes and objective standards and indeed objective reality. Its outgrowth is more akin to that of Nietzsche's philosophy than any other existent political ideology. So we should not be surprised that nationalism, which is liberal, at the level of the nation state, 
behaves pretty much as liberal individuals behave, prioritizing their own needs above others and sacrificing or denying any shared interest or concern, up to and including human life. And since liberalism ultimately just endorses and celebrates power, which is what nationalist states also do, they and it create an internal elite that accrues all advantage to themselves, a great cost to the wider citizenry and indeed the wider world. Finally, it is simply untenable to argue, as the statement does, that one of the merits of nationalism is that it enables the defense of religion. The authors inveigh against universalism as if liberals own universals. A more profound insight would be that liberals deny objective universals and reduce them to their own subjective takes, which they then claim are the only possible things one can think. Surely the authors are scholars enough to know that liberalism denies the existence of universals, for example, God or objective things, saying they don't exist, and even if they did, they couldn't be known. And all that there is is human projection and human assertion. Monotheism, which the authors purport to celebrate, is ineluctably universalist. It says that truth, beauty, and goodness are real qualities in the world and the cosmos, and they can be known and followed by all people. Judaism, contra Hazoni, is not just a religion of one tribe. It is the faith that is injuncted to introduce God to all the nations of the world. Israel is a priestly nation to others, not to itself. Analogously, Christianity is not just for one people, but for all the people on the earth. A faith that was reduced to or secured by nationalism would exemplify the betrayal of Christianity, like the degradation now experienced by Russian Orthodoxy when blessing nuclear missiles called Satan and the murderous elimination of Ukrainian culture. But the mistakes of all the above stem from a false opposition currently in vogue in American conservatism. Many conservatives now rightly, and I fully support them and stand with them, wish to oppose the libertarian domination and destruction of conservatism. And they wish to articulate that distinction following the success and victory of Donald Trump and what that meant. They have, however, opposed it with nationalism. But as I have argued, they are exposing, opposing extreme liberalism with, well, extreme liberalism. And they are not thinking as conservatives at all. They would be better advised to embrace universalism, as Burke did by moving from love of the particular to love of all mankind. For in the end, it is universalism, not nationalism, that better defends difference, particularity, and place. National conservatism is not conservative, and it does not protect the nation. So, I told you you would gradually disagree with me as I proceeded through the paper. So what to do, and from where and when, and the name of what shall we act? I'm slightly disturbed, I only have 18 minutes left. So the final part of my paper, I will extemporize. What I want to argue is that Samuel P. Huntington was right. That where we are now is in a clash of civilizations. And those civilizations are religious, a foundation, and nature. And this clash reflects the long durée of history. Nationalism is an insufficient approach to counter that threat. What I think we should recover as conservatives is the universal. We should take it back from liberals. Because if we surrender universalism to liberals, universalism or liberal universalism will always win. Human beings and the classical civilization that organizations like this extol, defend, and extend is universal in nature. We as conservatives cannot retreat from that. We simply have to describe universals differently. And in the, the words that follow, I try to make a very simple historical point building on the work of Eric Vogelin. Universals develop through empires. That's the historical claim I'm making. And their universals develop in and through empires. And empires gradually in encountering others and dominating them, no doubt in bloodthirsty ways, 
come to the discernment and the necessity politically of securing peace across diverse peoples. They uncover the universals. And paradoxically, the violence that initiated empires is then redeemed by the peace that empires bring about. In reality, I think there's no such thing as the nation state. Even today, America is an empire, clearly and evidently, that doesn't admit it and so can't act well in defending both it and the interests of that wider empire. The EU is also a form of empire in the sense that smaller nations recognize they can't exist by themselves. And the small, the different, and the divergent only exist by virtue of empire. And if they're not in an empire, they will be taken over and destroyed by another empire. That's the long lesson of history. And that, of course, is what is happening to Ukraine. So where I think conservative thought needs to go is to be far more philosophically able and combative. Do not let liberalism consign your thought to the world of the particular. Say liberalism is wrong about universals. There are shared goods. America is great not because it believes in itself, but because it believes in something greater than itself that other people can share in. I go to Ukraine a lot. I have family and friends there. They admire the West and they admire Western values. And it is in our interests that others join us so the polity can grow and stability can grow and war and violence can diminish. To reflexively step back and say it is not in our interest to extend our interest is a form of self-harm, parochialism, and damage to the true mission that I think we in the United Kingdom and you in America are a part of, which is a recovery and defense of the West. And it is ultimately the triumph and uniqueness of the West that in this conflict of civilizations is alone the civilizational block worth believing in. And that, my friends, is the future we must articulate and defend. Thank you. And I'll happily take questions. Obviously, silence is agreement with, with everything I'm arguing. All right. Our first question is, how do you define the West in particular? Is that Christianity? Is it something else? Also, maybe with the rise of secularism uh, and maybe the decline of traditional Christian belief and practice in the West, or I guess geographically, how do you define the West as a common thread? I would, I would define the West as a union of Greek and Jewish and Christian principles. So what we learn from, from Greece is henology, or the principle of the one. That against the sophists, against the relativists, against the people who say uh, sex isn't real, the world isn't real, I'm with Plato and Aristotle, who said there are universals. And universals allow us to understand the world and each other. And I'm with Alexander the Great, who was taught by Aristotle that anyone who wasn't Greek was a barbarian. But Alexander followed the logic of the universals and wanted to open up the whole world to a type of universal citizenship. But I'm also uh, with um, Christianity. And Christianity and Judaism wanted to distribute the goods of that to, to everybody. Christianity and Judaism give us the demos, the horizontal pole, the distributive pole. Greece gives us the one. Christianity, through the notion of the Trinity, through the notion of the Incarnation, Judaism through the notion of law, gives us the idea that we all can participate in the universal. And through all of us participating in the universal, we can secure what it is to be human for all of us. That is the West. And it's unique. And nobody else has come close to it. And that alone is the philosophy that can save the earth. Next question. Yes, we have a question from the app, and the question is, 
You've listed many of the issues with liberalism, but couldn't it be argued that liberal democracies have lifted more people out of poverty than any other system in history? And isn't that good? Yeah, if only that were true. Um, because the, the social system that has lifted more people out of poverty than, than any other in human history is Chinese communism. So, so it unfortunately just isn't true. And democracy itself is in retreat. And why? Because democracy isn't working. You know, if I go back to the Chartists in Britain in the 1830s, they thought if they secured the vote, they could secure economic equity, that they could redeem their situation. Well, the trouble is, now, in liberal democracies, the penalties of class are more entrenched than ever. In my country, the greatest indicators of what will happen to you or the postcode where you're born, and your mother's level of education. That's called fate. And America is far more class-ridden than my country. In America, class is almost caste. You have the least level of social mobility out of any of the developed nations. So I think it's important to recognize and realize that what the little stories we like to tell ourselves about liberal democracy are false. Next. Well, thank you very much for speaking. My question is similar to the last question in the sense that, do you believe that there is nothing whatsoever good that we have gained from liberalism? Things like uh, freedom of speech, perhaps gun rights, uh, uh, you know, uh, is there, you know, or it's just absolutely completely rotten, you know, abolition of slavery, any of these things which usually have been credited to liberalism, if you don't think any of them can be credited to liberalism, then what do you credit them towards? Well, let's take the abolition of slavery. If you want to be really serious, the people we should credit for the abolition of slavery are the British Empire and British Christians who weren't liberals. Um, the British Empire deployed one-sixth of the Royal Navy on the east of Africa and more on the west of Africa and interdicted the slave trade for nearly two generations. They destroyed the international slave trade. They bombed the slave states after the Council of Vienna in 1815. And the British state in the 19th century really wasn't liberal and wasn't doing it out of liberal uh, motives. It was doing it out of Christian motives. Now, I am not a liberal. My liberal, li liberty doesn't come from liberalism. Liberty comes from conservatism. Liberty comes from the idea that there are objective goods that exist in the world that I can't fully know. Liberty comes from intermediate associations between the state and the individual. Liberal states destroy intermediate associations. They destroy the possibility of acting collectively. They produce a disempowered individual against an all-powerful sta all state. Everything claimed for liberalism preceded liberalism. So that is why I am a liberal whose liberty does not come from liberalism. Next. Um, I really agree with the statement that you said about America as an empire, even though we don't want to admit that we are one. Um, I think in many ways, obviously, that comes, especially from more progressives, a deep self-hatred for uh, both successes and moral failures. But I think to some degree, there's a lot of self-doubt, even amongst part of the right in terms of what we do internationally. So my question is, how do we fix that? And do you believe an empire can survive if it refuses to admit it is one? Well, generally, um, empires that refuse to admit they are one fall apart, right? Because they don't do what's necessary to, to maintain it. And um, it's very clear that the West is not doing well and, and is in retreat. And I suppose, I suppose sometimes from what I hear from, I mean, most, lots of them are my friends, and I like them even if they don't like me. And... Um, <laughs> But a lot of what I hear when they start talking about national interest, we don't have an interest there, and is, is that is the sound of failure. When, when empires start talking like that, they lose their empire. And I, I rather like America, and I like, uh, I like the fact that it, it isn't just interested in, in power, it's interested in doing the good. 
I don't want liberals to be the only people arguing that. Because if liberals are the only people arguing that and they want to invade Afghanistan for human rights, that's insane. Conservatives need to be doing that and saying, no, our empire isn't one where we impose our vision of ourself. It, our empire is one where we preserve national distinction and therefore national liberty. And that, for me, is the responsible course. Yeah, uh, thank you for the great speech. Um, I seem to paradoxically find myself like agreeing and disagreeing with you simultaneously <laughs> on almost everything. Um, so I guess my question would be, how do you square the fact that it's uh, the nationalists in Europe, like I would say Hungary and Poland, who are the most fanatical defenders of the West, uh, rather than the universalists, say, in, like France and Germany? Well, that's not true of Hungary. So I've got, I think what Hungary has achieved domestically in its policy is superb. It's, it's pro-family policy. It's got one of the highest rates of growth in Europe and one of the lowest rates of inequality. Similarly with Poland, the express intention of both is to secure the life of the working class and they have uh, policies across the board for that. But Hungary, tragically, constantly makes the wrong decision in its history and, and allies with, with um, the wrong parties. And I think that it's hard to see how in its actions in respect of Russia, it's, it's defending the West in any way, shape or form. Poland, by contrast, which is truly governed, I think, by a wider sense of fraternity and the extension of its bonds to Ukrainian people, is, I think, a heroic defender of the West. And, and stands in a great lineage when the Poles came and joined us in, in the Battle of Britain as, as e exemplars of everything the West should stand for. And so, so I think it's, that's how we judge it, and that is how we should judge it. Thank you. What do you think about the direction of the Tories in Canada, and what would you recommend them in a post-Harper world? It's a very interesting question. I remember I went to, I met Stephen Har Harper and I was kind of appalled that um, we essentially had an oil-driven um, neoliberal conservative offer in the land that, of, that first crafted the idea of red Toryism. And it's no surprise to me that it lost and lost completely to one of the worst forms of liberalism that we have in the Western world. And that is your fate. Right? That is the fate of, of all conservatives who stand with the old kind of free market, kind of fiscally conservative model. That's where we'll end up. You'll end up with Trudeau. And so, so my injunction to them is my injunction to all conservative parties everywhere. Form, uh, liberalism is insecurity. The ultimate logic of liberalism, liberalism is creating mass insecurity for the majority. Economic insecurity, social insecurity, political insecurity, cultural insecurity. Conservatives should concentrate on that and they will be elected back into office across the board, in my view. Next. Thank you. Given the shared Judeo-Christian roots, that Latin America holds with, with, with the US and the West, I wanted to know particularly what's your, your impression of, of, of the role of Latin American uh, democracies and countries in, in, in this uh, scenario and what should be the, the, the approach from the US towards that region? Well, it's, it's a tragic region, I think, and um if you look at, if, if one divides between Central and, and, and then South America, as far as I can really tell, Central America is, is now governed by criminals and, and governed and dictated largely, though not exclusively, by state failure. Latin America itself ha, has much more hope. And I would have thought with a deeply Catholic population the idea of, of a securing Western Christian vision that 
speaks to the rampant insecurity that we see in Central America and in parts of Latin America would be very attractive indeed. And until we can recraft conservatism as a redemptive project that saves people from their lot, until we can create a conservatism that distributes capital, responsibility, and security to ordinary people, it will be seen as a philosophy of the elite. And elites don't inspire mass voting. Thanks for your fine talk. I have a, at the risk of being a little cute, uh, my question for you is, how would the policy platform of imperial conservatives differ from national conservatives? Thank you. I think that many of the policies that I would talk about with national conservatives domestically would resonate. I'd see no difference between what would we would offer the working class uh, from a national conservative position or the position I would uh, um, endorse. What I would seek to do, however, is where it would differ is in foreign affairs and internationally. I think it's crucial if civilization is to survive that we stabilize other nations. America will be unhomed by mass migration from unstable nations at your southern border. You already have 20 million, and they're busing up to, to Washington, and we, we see them in tents, don't we? So you can't have peace at home unless you secure peace abroad. And I think that, that ultimately that, that is what requires. So I'm not speaking in, I think, in contradistinction to a domestic policy agenda nationalists might have. I just want to extend that policy agenda to others. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Philip. Have another round of applause for a great speech, and thanks for taking Thank our questions. Thank you very much.